Ah, excellent. Another Vital Asserta game. Yes, always like getting these. Why is it all blue? Ah, oh, whatever. I'm sure I'll find out later. And who's that guy? And who's that guy? And who's that guy? Uh, ah, well, I'm sure the game will explain it all to me anyway. Hi everyone, welcome to another Broken Meeple review. I'm Luke Hector and today it is a beast of a game. And this one, I think everyone's been asking me to get this one review because, well, I've already been banging on about the fact that I like Vital Lacerda games. And, it, you know, if you want proof I do like heavy games, come on, Vital Lacerda games, they're heavy, admit it. But yeah, Vinyos, top 100. Gallerist, even higher, top 100. Kanban, slightly higher than Gallerist, top 100. His games are that that perfect blend of theme being strong with mechanics that are interesting and fun. Granted, they go a bit long. They start approaching that three hour mark and it's like, oh God. But the theme is strong enough to keep me engaged for those three hours, you know, so it's not as bad as say some of the other games which are more drier. That's just from my perspective. So to get another one called, oh, if I'm weightlifting, just take up VL the Serta games, they're heavy enough. Vital Sorters Lisboa or Lisbon or whatever you want to call it really. There's even enough room in the camera for it. That's how big this thing is. This thing is giant. This is another game from Eagle Griffin Games which is this standard affair really. Giant, long, Euro with heavy mechanics and a huge dollop of theme. But we'll get onto that aspect a little bit later. So I wonder if I can put this somewhere where it's a little less Reflected? No, eh, we'll leave it there. It should be alright. So, what do you do in Lisboa? Lisboa is all about rebuilding Lisbon itself. It's set in a historical time period where basically everything that could happen to Lisbon, that was bad, happened. Pretty much in the same period. I mean, the history in this is like very detailed and it goes into how it suffered from earthquakes, from floods, from fires, all within like a certain short period. I mean, wow, okay. <laughs> You know, somebody was throwing darts at Lisbon or something, you know, and just happened to inflict all these disasters on it. But the idea is, is that this has happened, this calamity has happened, and now you are rebuilding Lisbon. So you are putting out new stores, you are clearing up the rubble from the, you know, from the landscape, and you're influencing, an, you know, these three nobles, an architect, the king, and a minister, in order to utilize various action cards that you'll play, get influence, get money. There's all sorts you're doing in this, and it's, I wouldn't call it quite as close to a point salad, but there's certainly a lot of ways that you can score and a lot of ways that you can play the game. So throughout it, you are playing cards from your hand and this constantly refreshes into a portfolio. You have two choices, play it into your own player board portfolio or play it onto the board itself in the Royal Court as it's called. Playing it in those areas will trigger off different things. You know, you'll be able to gain influence, gain money, clear rubble, collect uh, clergy tiles, which are kind of like uh, special abilities for the rest of the game, collect decrees, which are end game objective scoring. And each turn you will play these cards, utilizing different people, utilizing different aspects of your collection resources. There's so much, and I haven't got time in this video to go into supreme detail on this. I just suggest go and watch some videos on YouTube and you know have a look at it yourself for a more detailed rules explanation. But the idea with this is that it's very much a long, heavy Euro, but with a healthy dose of theme and a strong historical backing behind it. So let's first talk about that theme, because you know me, I'm big on that sort of thing. You know, theme has got to be strong for me to really class the game as great. And Vinyos, no problem. Feel like building the vineyard, going to the wine fair, fantastic theme. Gallerist, not even a big art fan myself, but the gallerist makes sense with what you're doing. I feel like I'm running an art gallery. And Kanban, perfect theme. I feel like I'm dodging my boss Sandra whilst building cars. Great. Is the theme as strong as this one? Yes. 
Yeah, put simply, it is very strong. However, this is purely a subjective viewpoint. I am going to stipulate this right now. This game has no doubt got a very, very strong theme. The rulebook goes into detail at various points to explain the historical reason why these three people are there, who they are, what time period it's set in, why there's rubble, what three disasters took place, why the clergy was so important, why the board is all blue and white everywhere, which we'll get onto a bit later. You know, it is no doubt whatsoever in my mind that this theme is super strong and credit to Vital for putting it so strongly. Because this is obviously, I mean, this is like his home country. Possibly his home city, I think. And, you know, so he takes this to heart. This is very close to him. And so I credit that he's put this into a game and believed it to be strong enough. Uh, problem is, and this is purely subjective, I just don't particularly care for the theme. You know, I, I think it's super strong. It is there. But... When you explain this game, you kind of have to explain the history behind it in order for the stuff to be intuitive. You know, the rules are quite complex, there's a fair amount you're doing here, and after a game you'll get used to it and you'll be like, oh right, I can play this again, I kind of know what I'm doing now. So expect your first game to be a learning curve, but it's usually advised by some people, even the designer himself, to explain the history as well as the rules. If you want to sit there for a good 30 to 60 minutes before you start the game, then great. You know, you can happily uh, explain all the history you want. But when I got explained it, I was kind of just glossing over a lot of that. The problem is, without the history, a lot of the rules in this aren't that intuitive. You need to know that history to understand why things are as they are. Otherwise, it just feels like you're playing a bunch of mechanics again. And as I said purely subjective. There are people who are engrossed by this theme, who love it to bits. Fair play to you. It's just, if you know me in my games, I don't tend to get that interested in the purely historical nature of a game. I mean, there are exceptions. Uh, Founding Fathers there, for example, is probably the biggest exception to the rule in that regard, but that's mainly because I love the mechanics so much. But this, the you know, the theme is super strong. I just don't overly care. You know, I've already forgotten the names of the three, uh, like the minister, the king, and the architect. They've got names. Couldn't remember them. Couldn't care less. You know, the tiles on the board, the reason why it's blue and white, as uh, as a Julo, I don't know. It's, you know, tiles that were in Lisbon or might still be now. You know, it's, they're, they're obviously there, and it obviously makes sense. I'm not denying that, but for me... The theme just really just doesn't grab me. Nowhere near as much as, say, the themes of Vinyos, Gallerist, and Kanban do. So that's not a negative on the game itself. It's just purely me on that one. You know, the theme is super strong, and if you're interested in the history of Lisbon and all that, then you are going to get a kick out of this because you'll learn something good, you'll learn something useful, and it will help you enjoy the game even more. But it's not all just theme. I'm all about balance here. You need theme, you need good mechanics as well. So do the mechanics measure up to the theme? Definitely yes. Honestly, as much as I say that the theme doesn't interest me, the mechanics in this are sound. You know, it really does work and flow quite smoothly once you get over that learning curve. I would say that this has got one of the bigger learning curves I've had out of all the games. And I know some people believe that Kanban is the hardest to learn. And I can see where they're coming from on that. It's a busy board. It was one of the earlier designs. And, you know, it needed a whole geek list on Board Game Geek in order to get the rules perfectly sound. But that whole thing, everybody knows what you do to build a car. Everybody knows about dodging your boss at work. So the stuff you do in there is more intuitive. With this, you're... Most people don't really know about the history of Lisbon, and unless you get it explained, you're probably going to just be looking at the board and trying to remember all the rules. And there's a lot. Because not only do you have the rule book, each player has their own player aid book. In fact, I wonder if I can get it out. Let me take this out of shot for a bit. This is... I mean, it's good. It's a good rule aid, but imagine you've just been invited to this game. And you see somebody, you know, get the rule books out, and you go, it's like, ah... There's the game rules. Okay, cool. There's a fair amount in there. Good pictorial explanation. And to be fair, it is a very good rule book. I'll give it that. I think Vital's rule books generally are, actually. But then you get given this. Your player aid book with several pages in it. It is by no means amazingly useful. 
It tells you what all the clergy tiles do, what all the decrees do, what all the card symbols do. It explains the iconography, the turn sequence, what you need to get certain things. It's great. But my god, it's a daunting experience to be just given this when you get explained the game. So I will stress that you are going to have to accept that there is a learning curve to this game. You're going to need at least one game to get really to grips with how it plays. <coughs> and you're going to need a good teacher. You know, I do not recommend that you try and play this with, you know, three completely new players, including yourself, and try and play this. Because you're going to be there for hours and hours and hours, as I found out the first time I played this. I kid you not, four of us, three new players, one teacher was just not that great at teaching the game. This game took us over six hours. You know, and that's not even including a lunch break. It took... Forever. And I think an hour of that was the rule explanation. It really didn't go down well from a time perspective. But I accepted that this was mainly down to, you know, partially the teaching and four of us playing and completely new to this game. So I glossed over it and figured, oh, well, it's a learning game. It will be better. And subsequently, it has been. I've played this with... <coughs> Sorry, I'm out of break. Uh, two, three, and four players. And the length has typically been around that kind of three hour mark, maybe slightly longer, a bit shorter with two players. So it kind of balances out. I've never had this go less than two and a half hours. You know, it's a fairly lengthy game, but it's still, you know, that's still reasonable length and typical of Vital Lacerders. However, I don't think I'm ever going to want to play this with four again, because when you add an extra player, the main thing you are doing is adding time. You add little extra elements like, you know, another ship you can trade with and another player that you can copy actions from. If you remember the gallerist, you can spend influence to copy actions. Well, you've got that in this one as well. You just use tokens and it happens less often. So, you know, that's a cool aspect. But the time of having four of you play this is just too much for me. Not to say that the game just fails at that four, it's just it reaches that plateau of why, like, okay, this is too long, too many people I've got to remind of the rules, too many people checking things out of player aid books, too many people following actions, because remember, those are bonus turns. So as well as the four turns that everybody is having, which can take a fair while to resolve and think about what you're doing, you've also got the bonus turns. And imagine if you are the person who has, you know, just had their turn, and then the player after you has their turn, and then the other two have bonus tokens, and they both use them. They get a bonus turn, they get a bonus turn, that's his done, goes back to his normal turn, his normal turn. So that's five turns minimum, that's assuming this guy doesn't use a favour token for one of the other two, that you've got to wait before it gets to your turn, and that's assuming you haven't got favour tokens yourself. And they're not that common. You can get them, but it's not like you're going to be showered in them. So the downtime with four players just gets ridiculous. Free has been pretty good, actually. Free is another sweet spot I like in Euros, and it does work quite well at three. I've actually found, strangely enough, that I love this best with two. Because I played a two-player game of this, uh, you know, first off, and thought, wow, that ended quicker than I expected. And it was good back and forth. You know, one of the rows is covered up on the board, but aside from that, there's not a huge amount of difference in the setup. So it was like... Okay, that's cool. Let's try this again with uh, somebody else and two players. And it went exactly the same way. This is one that, you know, with good practice and the same two people, you could play this in under two hours. I feel confident you could probably do that. And it just seems to flow really nicely. You take your turn, and by the time they've taken their turn, you've just about thought about what you're going to do. And if someone takes a bonus turn, it doesn't throw the tempo of the game too much. You know, it's not like you've got so much downtime because you've just basically had your turn. You've got, at most, two turns to wait before it's back round to you again. So, I find the two player is actually the best way to play this. And I didn't think I'd say that, because normally three is my sweet spot. And I still enjoy it with three, but I seem to really like it with two. And the solo mode's not bad in this anyway. It's a bit like his other games where you have basically the Vital Lacerda AI player and he seems to get everything and seems to have all the good stuff and you're basically, uh, you start the ground sort of walking while he's running away from you and you've got to basically catch him up and get more points and various uh, objectives compared to him. I've tried the solo mode in Vinyos. I am apparently really bad at it <laughs> because Vital just basically wipes the floor with me sometimes and that. In this one, again, not easy. Not an easy solo mode. 
but it's good fun and I do recommend you actually try the solo mode out if you want to learn the rules of the game because it does go over a lot of the mechanics even though there are some differences because of the AI player it's not too dissimilar from playing a two-player game so if you can master the solo mode you're in a good position to start teaching the game to someone else so definitely one two or three players really love this game four just a bit too long for me but I get if people don't mind the length then four players go for it it still works I just would rather play it with less Moving on to components, and well, this is Eagle Griffin, and it's one of their deluxe boxes, so you know the components in this are good. And they are. I mean, you've got a nice, perfectly written rule book, you've got like several player aids, you've got a very chunky, thick board with artwork by, um, you know, Ian O'Toole, you know, the same bloke who did, uh, you know, Vinyosnat, so if you like his art style, you're going to get it just here, although, more on that in a minute, we'll get round to that. You know, you've got uh, extra boards, extra little tiles, you have got tokens galore, you've got baggies, and this is not a Kickstarter version. You could kickstart this and get like some extra sort of better looking tokens and some little miniatures and that, but other than that there's not a huge amount of difference between the Kickstarter and the retail version, and certainly not enough that I suggest you must get the Kickstarter version. This is a retail edition. I am perfectly happy with the retail edition. I have no interest in getting the Kickstarter version. But you're getting your money's worth. And it's not a cheap game. You're talking £80 plus, And that's from a decent discount site to get this game. This is expensive. You have to know that you're going to be playing this multiple times to justify that price cost. But you're certainly getting decent components. And for what it's worth, decent artwork as well. I say for what it's worth. And again, this is purely subjective. The board is, it looks pretty and it looks colourful, but it's basically sort of pastel-like. I mean, if I can't show you well enough here, I'll put up a picture anyway, but you can see that it's got this kind of pastel-style look with, you know, a lot of blue and white. You know, and the reason for that, and I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's basically the colour of the tiles and various things that Lisbon had. So I get the historical reason for it. I'm not sure it translates as well into a graphic design for a board game though. Because the problem I've had, and several others have had when playing this, is that because the board is predominantly this blue and white texture of the colour, a lot of the stuff blends in a bit too easily with each other. You know, nothing really stands out as, you know, oh, it's this section is that, that section is that. Because you're looking at it going, okay, is that part of the decoration or is that actually a space to put cards? I'm not entirely sure. And if you're playing you know, the full board out with four of you and that and you're trying to look over at someone else's board, you're going to be squinting a little bit trying to make out certain things, particularly the clergy tiles, which you know are only this big. Oh, sorry, that's the favourite token. Um, well, actually, the clergy tiles, there you go, same size. This is a clergy tile. Imagine you've got to look at about eight of these on the board that are some distance away from you and then also notice what's on other players' boards. You're going to be straining your eyes a little bit to make out certain details on this as I ended up doing. And I've got, I've had laser eye surgery. I've got, you know, perfect vision now, subject to dry eye, but I digress. So I'm looking at this board thinking that everything kind of blends in a little bit too well, but you get used to it over time. But to begin with, I, maybe I just wish that there was a little bit more colour differentiation with the various spots, even if it was just borders, to really show that that is this section, that is a card space, that is the top, you know. I found it just blended a little too well. But again, a, a lot of people have also commented that they absolutely adore this style of art and think it looks beautiful. And I'm not going to say the game's ugly. No way. I mean, this is a very pretty looking board. Just maybe I could have done without the whole blue and white thing. I know it's historically accurate, but it just a bit of a strain on the eyes. So I've mentioned the theme, the components, the player count, but the mechanics themselves and the gameplay. They are super sound as well. I may not necessarily like the theme, but I have a blast playing this just like I do with other games. The card play in particular is probably my favourite aspect because I love multi-use cards. And granted, there's only really two uses for a card. I wish there was three, but... You know, you have this hand of cards and playing them on your portfolio triggers certain actions, putting them in the court triggers other actions. You know, you can either, you know, get rid of the cards later or you can get more. 
um, when you draw at the end of your turn, you can choose which pile you want it from, and you're looking at, all right, um, that guy's the green architect dude, right, I'm gonna need to use him at some point. Ah, oh, but the king card has got that bonus I really want. And this is typical of a lot of Vitals games now. You get a bonus for doing pretty much anything in the game. I like that system. The gallerist had it. Every time you got a international token on the gallerist, you got a bonus. Every time you sold a piece of art, you got a bonus. I like being rewarded for doing stuff. I don't like being punished or punched in the face for doing stuff. So that's why I don't like punishing games, among other reasons. But in this, you build a store, cover up a bonus, get the bonus. Uh, you build a public building, cover up a space, get the bonus. You know, collect a set of cubes. <laughs> kind of weird why collecting sets of cubes is, that's probably the one thematic thing that's a bit dodgy. But collecting a set of three different colour cubes opens up your warehouse and uh, your ability to play more cards. Don't quite get why that works, but hey, you know, you've got to throw some uh, set collection in there somewhere, haven't you? But I really do enjoy the card play system. It's easily what gravitates me towards this game more. Building the buildings is okay, you basically build them on a grid and you're looking at rows and columns, which is kind of weird from a thematic perspective, but it works. You know, you're looking at whether people are going to build the public buildings around them and score yours, and I like that you score even if you've already built the building. To digress a little bit more into that, basically you would normally expect that if you built a building and then someone built a public building afterwards, you'd miss out on the scoring because, oh well, you were too early and they came in late. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you built the building first, before the public building, or after. You still get the points as long as they connect and match the symbol colours. So that's really cool. You don't have to feel like you're being pushed out of a race too much. It doesn't feel punishing. And I suppose that's one thing I really like about this. Yes, it's difficult to do well in. And yes, you may mess up on a turn and think, oh, I really should have done that. Ah, oh, oh, I'm low on this. What am I going to do? But I've never felt that I'm being unduly punished. And that keeps me going. Even though the theme is not one I go mad over, I'm still engaged. I'm not feeling, you know, down. You know, I don't feel a downer for being unduly punished or, you know, losing too badly or anything like that. It just seems to flow really nicely. Now, it's mostly a rinse and repeat affair. I mean, the cards get better over time as the game goes on, but essentially, you build stores, you build buildings, you play the cards, and you just slightly get more cubes, you know. So, progression is ho-hum. Yeah, yeah, you see the buildings build up and that, but aside from just scoring more points, there's only so much you notice that as you play. But by the time it gets to that point, you're kind of close to finishing the game, and I like that there's two ways to end the game drain certain piles of cards, or collect enough cubes. The rubble cubes, basically. So that does, you know, mean that there's a good tension at the end for having, all right, I need to do this and this, but, oh, if he takes that card, we're going to end this round and then only get one more round each. And that person might decide, yeah, you know what, I'm going to leave that card there. I want an extra round, you know. So you've always got to look at where who could potentially end the game. And people can pull the rug from out of you as well. So... I do enjoy it. I, I think it's a sound, mechanical game. So to summarise with Lisboa, theme, solid. You know, I may not like the theme, you know, it may just not be for me, that's fine, I'm just not a history fan. You know, this is definitely my least favourite theme out of Vita the Surgeon's Games. Again, purely subjective, not, you know, not something I'm going to say about everybody who plays this. I know people who are such history fans that they just gravitate towards this, they understand it, they go with it. Great, good on you. It's definitely highly thematic and definitely very well tied in to the history that lies underneath it. The mechanics sound. It is a very cool game. I think that the learning curve is a bit high, though, compared to his other games. I, I find it easier to teach the gallerist. Even the Kanban, because yes, you know, the rule book for Kanban is not great, but people just understand that theme better. Vinyos, mm, that's got a fair bit of a learning curve, but again, people understand winemaking. It's just, you don't have to be an expert in making wine to know that you have to get a vineyard and grow grapes and take the wine and that you have it at fairs, you know. People just know this stuff at a general knowledge, whereas this one requires you to have a history lesson to really understand the theme, and history lessons put me to sleep so bad. I gave up history after year eight of school. That's how little I liked history. I really was more of a geography person. So I would certainly love to visit Lisbon, 
you know, and <laughs> check in the culture and check out the food. I'm such a foodie when I go on holiday. But history, yeah, just not for me. It's just not my thing. So with this, great theme, great mechanics. Plays a bit too long, especially at four. Two is definitely the sweet spot. Three is fine. I like the solo mode as well. Although, to be honest, if you're going to play a solo mode for that long, there are other Euro games. So two or three is definitely the sweet spot. And... I also have to say that the learning curve is quite steep. I mean, it's almost like vertical because you've got that big rule book, you've got that player aid book, and yes, it helps, but it's going to be daunting on your first game, except that your first game is a learning game, and if you lose, that is probably most likely the case because if anybody is like played this game a few times, they're going to beat you. It's just going to happen, except that you've got to learn it first, and then the next game, you're like, right, I'm ready to give this a proper try now. I understand why this does this and why that does that. Let's do it. And, I mean, you're not going to do it straight, one straight after the other. I mean, seriously, where do you find the time? But at least when you when you bring it to the table again, you'll be able to enjoy it more there. So, out of all of Vital Asurda's games, this one ranks somewhere around Vinyos's level. I still find Kanban to be my favourite. Yes, the rule book is a bit ho-hum and that, but I know how to play the game. It's a great theme. It's intuitive theme because people know what goes into building the car and dodging your boss. So I still love that one. I think Galarus is his best design because I think that's the most accessible out of his games, as well as the taking turns out of order, you know, reducing the downtime even with four players. And, you know, the fact that it feels like running an art gallery, the theme is super strong in that and looks the business. Vinyos is, it was lower down on my top 100, but I love winemaking as a theme and Vinyos has a great strong theme. I am talking about the 2016 version though, not the 2010 one. I have not played the 2010 one. My review was only of the 16 one. And to be honest, the 2010 just looks like it overcomplicates things way too much. You know, I think the 16 version is more, looks more streamlined and plays just fine. So I'm not desperate to try the 10 version out anytime soon. Lisbon, Lisboa, whatever. Um, I would probably say this could make my top 100. It could. I think it genuinely could. But it's that theme. I'm really torn on this because... You know, it, it, I get that. But the other themes of his games entice me more. Even the gallerist. I'm not even an art fan and I prefer that theme. Because it's not being historical. It's more, you know, it's, well, it's art. This one, the mechanics are sound and I want to play it for the mechanics. But the theme puts me off wanting to play it too often. Just because I don't particularly, you know, I know it sounds bad, but I just don't particularly care about the history. You know, it's there, but I'm not interested in what the guys are called. I'm not interested in why the tiles are blue and white. You know, it's like, it's there, but let me play it. So I would think this would rank a little bit below Vinyos for me, which does make it, yeah, I know it sounds bad, my fourth, you know, the fourth favourite of the Lacerda games when he's only done about five or so, but all of his games could feature in my top 100. That's not small praise, okay? Out of all the games I've played for nearly all of his games to be in my top 100, is a pretty big deal. You know, I think that even if the even with this one having a theme I don't gravitate towards, I like it enough to play that it could still be there. And I do like some dry games. Come on, Terra Mystica and all that lot. You've seen these on my on my list and my shelf. I do enjoy these sort of things. So, I think that's all I can really say otherwise this video is going to be ridiculously long. Lisboa is a solid game. Personally, rating probably about I think seven's a bit low. I would probably give it an eight. You know, it is solid mechanically. I just wish it had a theme that gravitated towards me more personally, but that's purely subjective. I get that. You know, if people are going to say this is brilliant, this is their favorite Lacerda game, no problem with that. I can see exactly where they're coming from. I just prefer the other Lacerda games. So, that's it for me on this one. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the podcast, the blog, and the YouTube channel. I'm Luke Hector, and I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple Review. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hope it wasn't too long for you.